Canary tokens are identifying links that can be used to track anybody who clicks on them, or where they're shared. Today, we'll take a look at how to use them on this episode of Cyber Weapons Lab. When sharing a link in an online conversation like Slack or Skype, it's common for these services to reach out and attempt to generate a thumbnail to let the people in the conversation know what's on the other end of the URL. Now, while this is convenient and helpful, it's also a common way that hackers and penetration testers are able to determine that someone's found the phishing page or other URL that they've created. Now, the reason for this is that because Slack and Skype are trying to generate a preview, they're actually requesting data from the server. And you can monitor this to determine whether someone is clicking on a link or discussing a link in a private conversation. Now, we can simulate this with a canary token, which is basically a trackable link that lets us know anytime anybody requests it. And we can demonstrate this by sharing it in a private Slack or Signal conversation and comparing the two to see what happens when we generate a preview versus when we don't. One of them is definitely trackable and will allow you to track not only the participants in the conversation if they click on the link, but also where it's shared and which services it's being shared on. Now, in order to do this, you'll just need to have a browser because we'll be able to generate and then click on these links all from the same uh, browser window. We can demonstrate how this looks on mobile and also look into a couple other creative applications of using Canary tokens that allow you to do things like track when a user has logged into their computer. As soon as you have a browser ready to log in, then we can begin. Now to get started with Canary Tokens, you can go to canarytokens.com generate. Here you can see there's a bunch of different types of tokens that we can use. So in order to select the one we want, we're going to go to the web bug URL token. But I wanna take a second and look at some of the other ones that are available so you can see exactly what choices you have. There are also DNS tokens, which means anytime a website lookup look is performed, you'll be notified. A unique email address so that you can track when somebody emails it. A custom uh, web image bug, which means something you can input into a website or maybe an email that you want to monitor. And then you can see there's also uh, Microsoft Word documents, Adobe PDF documents, and a Windows folder. So these are all really interesting ways of being able to track people over the internet. And we'll start out with the web bug, which is using the Netscape Navigator uh, icon. I don't know why, but that's fine. Um, and then I'm going to provide an email address. Um, and then a notification. And I'm gonna create the notification now. So here we go. The web token is active. And we can also see some suggestions here. We can do an email with a juicy subject line embedded in documents. Uh, and to start, I'm gonna go ahead and just go to it and see exactly what we see when we put this in. So I'll start out just, I'll do this window. And that is not it. <laughs> Sorry, let's grab this. This is a great tool that we'll maybe cover some other time. There we go. So we get a blank page. We don't see anything. What happened? So if we go back, we can see the Canary token can be managed at this link. So here we'll click on history in order to see what's going on. And boom, it located us. It knows exactly where we are. So if I click on this, I can see, oh no, it knows the city I'm in. And then it also knows that we're not using a Tor exit node. Um, it can get the user agent, so it knows that I'm using Chrome, which is accurate, and it can also see the local IP address. No, okay, so that all sucks. Uh, we can see that, uh, oh, we're even getting some information about the browser. Okay, that's cool. I actually didn't see this last time. So we can see some information about the application here. We can see this from Google, and then I'm running this on a Mac. So that is all fascinating because it allows us to identify uniquely different people clicking on this link. So if you wanna go through and know exactly how many people are clicking on it or exactly what the kind of traffic is, we can sort it by device and kind of get a uh, more accurate picture of this by exporting it to a JSON format or CSV. So if we get a link with a whole bunch of traffic, 
this can let us know that people are clicking on it and we can start to see what kind of people they are by looking at the devices and looking for small differences like maybe the version of the operating system they're using or something else identifiable. So we can actually just use this to look it up. I was going to do a GOP lookup, but I actually forgot that it provides this handy little map because if you just get the email alert, then it doesn't actually uh, go ahead and give you this interactive zoom inable map. So anyway, what we're going to look at next is what we can do to actually use this token to identify when people are talking about it, but not clicking on it. So there was a security researcher who noticed that when they were setting up their infrastructure, there was a bunch of pings on it from Slack and from Skype. And that was pretty confusing because he had no idea why these companies would be visiting his link, which was designed for phishing a client. So what he realized was that in actual fact, it was two people having a conversation about his uh, particular infrastructure. And because they were sharing the link on um, Slack, or actually I think, I think it was uh, Skype. Since they were sharing the link on Skype, Skype was actually going out and fetching a preview and in doing so was leaving kind of a notification that somebody had reached out. So two people having a conversation in a Skype chat, which was private and he couldn't see, he was alerted of by uh, actually request from Skype to generate previews each time the people would post or look at the link. So I did some experimenting and it turns out that th this really does work. So let's go into a couple different messengers and see if we can get this behavior and also look at different alternatives if we don't want that to happen. So first, let's go ahead and go to Skype. So I'm going to go ahead and paste this link in here, but I'm not going to click on it. So after a second, we see that it's generated a preview here. And if we go back to our Canary token, then we should be able to refresh it and see, hey, we've got more contacts, this one in the United States. And when we look at it, we can expand it and see that it is a Skype URI preview. So we've identified that this is a, a Skype uh, user agent that's going in and grabbing the preview, which lets us know, hey, somebody has shared this link that we've created uh, inside of a Skype conversation. So does this work against other types? Well, let's check it out. We'll go ahead and put this into a Slack window. And we can see here that it actually hasn't expanded this into a preview, but we might be able to get a hit anyway. So let's take a look. When we refresh, hey, we have even more hits. This one from Frankfurt. And we can see this is an Amazon server, but it's working as a Slack proxy. So even though we didn't even uh, get a preview for this in Slack, we still actually were able to detect that somebody had shared it. Now, after some testing, I shared this in our Nullbyte Slack, and I was able to determine that every single time someone opened Slack that contained this link, uh, Slack would go out and ping this uh, uh, Canary token in order to get a preview, even though it, the preview actually never came up. So I got a ping every single time an individual user accessed this Slack chat, and it was an interesting way of being able to monitor how frequently people were accessing the chat. So if you want to use this as a way of seeing how often people are logging into a chat you're having, that was kind of an uh, interesting side effect when using this tool with Slack. So finally, I'm going to go to a more privacy focused messenger and drop this into a signal window. And here you can see that I don't get any sort of preview. And if I were to refresh this, then I should not see any additional contacts. So this is really cool, but are there ways that we can get around this? Well, you could probably guess that I might not actually be in Sweden uh, because of my accent. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change my VPN and select a different location and see if we can actually trick the tracking script into thinking that I'm somewhere else. So let's say that we're going to be in Hong Kong. And we can take this a step further by actually trying to change our user agent. So the user agent is basically what the browser reports itself as. And in this case, I'm going to switch our user agent with this uh, Google Chrome add-on to something a little ridiculous. Let's say an iPod. It's been a minute. So now we are reporting ourselves as an iPod and our location is in Hong Kong. So let's see if we can go ahead and visit this Canary link 
and get it to think that we are someone other than who we really are. So this is hopefully some proof that while it is pretty easy to track people, we can still make it difficult to know exactly who we are and what our system is by doing a couple of things to protect our privacy. Now it looks like it might have resolved, so let's see if we can get another detection. And whoa, all right, here we go. This looks like, where is this? That looks like maybe, that's not, let's see. Okay, this looks like Malaysia, which is sort of close. Um, and we can see that this is still reading as a Macintosh. So let's see if we can do another refresh and maybe get this to think we're someone else. Of course, if it's able to actually still track us, then that's great. But I just feel like we might be able to get it to think we're at the very least in Hong Kong. All right, we've loaded it again. Let's give this a try. Up, oh, and we appear to still be in Malaysia. Well, that's okay. At least we've still tricked the service into thinking that we're somewhere where we're not, but it looks like our attempt to deceive the system with a browser add-on didn't work. Even though we're able to use this to spoof other things, it wasn't able to convincingly change this, but let's go ahead and try, let's say Firefox on an Android tablet and see if this is able to deceive the tracker. There we go. Now with one last refresh, we can see that we are now on an Android tablet. So we were actually able to defeat the user agent recognition and hide the fact that we're on a macOS computer. While we still appear to be in Malaysia, that's probably just an issue with the VPN. And I wouldn't think that we couldn't just use some other sort of uh, VPN to change our location if we want to. So here we prove that while this is a powerful tool, we can still hide ourselves via, uh, via these different privacy-focused tools. Now, of course, the best known privacy-focused tool is Tor. So I'm gonna go ahead and throw this into the Tor browser, which is not updated all the way. So please don't do what I'm doing and run an old version of the Tor browser. I tried to update it, but it just failed. Uh, posting this into the Tor browser, we should be able to access this from a completely different IP address. However, Canary tokens will be able, hopefully, to detect if this is a known Tor exit node. Here we go, another detection. And we can see that this is from Germany, but in this case, we can see that it tests positive as a known Tor exit node, meaning that 100% this user is using Tor, and we can't rely on this being the actual identification of the system. We can see that also it thinks it's Mozilla Firefox, um, but it's not really totally sure. So this is probably our best bet for staying anonymous. However, you might note that because it's fairly obvious to fingerprint a Tor node, it's very possible that somebody can block all Tor nodes from their service if they don't want to deal with people making mischief. So uh, keep in mind that a lot of people won't use Tor nodes because it bans them from seeing certain sites that don't want to deal with people who are trying to do possibly sketchy stuff. Now, another interesting side effect we'll take a look at before we go is using a URL shortener. So we'll go ahead and shorten this with bit.ly. And then once we copy this, we're gonna go ahead and post it back into our Slack conversation. And there's an interesting thing that happens in some types of messengers. Now this bit.ly link doesn't directly say that it's a Canary Tokens link, which would obviously make us look up Canary Tokens and figure out that this is a tracking sort of link. This is just a shortened link, which makes it harder for the person who's seeing it to know that it could be tracking their behavior. Now I haven't clicked on it, but if we go back to Canary Tokens and refresh again, then we should see another Slack image proxy, even this one coming from Japan, even though this is a shortened link and we never clicked on it. So simply by being in the same Slack chat as this shortened link, we can still tell that somebody is there looking at it, which is really interesting because it's the equivalent of a read receipt that you can send in a group chat and know when certain people are looking at it. Because even though you won't be able to see the individuals, you will be able to see each ping every single time someone new either opens a Slack window or refreshes the, the uh, chat. 
While we've gone over a couple of different use cases for canary tokens, there are a lot of different creative and interesting ways you can use them. In one, you can embed them in a startup script so that as soon as someone logs into their computer, it requests a canary token and alerts you to the login, as well as giving you their IP address. In another, you can actually create a canary token that's an image and embed it into an email, alerting you when someone actually opens and reads the email. Now, commercial services use tools like this all the time to track you, so you should be aware that anytime you click on a link, you might be exposing yourself into giving up this kind of information. That's all we have for this episode of Cyber Weapons Lab. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. And if you have any thoughts or feedback on the show, send me a message on Twitter, because I'd love to hear from you. We'll see you next time.